Dear listeners, welcome back to this latest episode of the podcast series, The Way Out is In. I am Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems change. And I am Brother Fab Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk, a student of Zen Master Tikihan in the Plum Village tradition. And today, Brother, we are going to be talking about fame and humility. In the West, we, we are living in a fame-obsessed society, and we all know that fame can come at a very heavy price. And also we know that actually when we are in our center and when we have humility, actually that can be a great power. So what we're going to be doing today is exploring those two dimensions. The way out is in. Hello, dear listeners. I am Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fap Hu. Brother Fap Hu, this is the first time we've been recording away from each other. I miss you. I'm not sitting in Thai's sitting still hut. I can see both of you and Kata, who's doing all the recording, sitting in Thai's cozy hut. And I'm in the Garrison Institute, which is this very large um, contemplative center in, uh, in the Hudson Valley of New York. And here it's snowing. And there, I imagine it's much warmer. It's warmer. Flowers are blooming everywhere. We have had a lot of rain. But Joe, are you skipping on activity? Shouldn't you be contemplating? Why are you speaking to me? Because, Fapu, I'm talking to you because speaking to you is a contemplation. I find, I find, I find these recordings are my teachings. It's sort of, um, I'm sitting at the knee of Brother Fapu, listening to his wisdom and soaking it all up. Okay, people, he's not sitting at my knee. Well put, though. This is very contemplative to be able to share together. And it's been a while. I know people are missing the podcast, so it's so great to still come together through technology and look deeply at a topic. Yeah. So, brother, today we uh, we just decided to talk about fame and humility. Um, these are two really important areas because it's about really how do we show up in the world and what is it what is it to f- be enough in the world? How do how do we actually be in our fullness without actually going beyond our reach? So, do you want to start? by telling us a little bit about how you see these two, because humility and fame are very much based in the Zen tradition about understanding how to live a good life. I'm going to start with humility first, because that is such an important quality that was introduced to me the moment I entered into the monastic training. And humility also represents openness, for us to enter into a spiritual path or into anything that we want to grow, we need an element of openness, of humility. It means we have to humble our ego. We have to let go of our knowledge. We have to come in with open eyes and open ears and an open mind and an open heart in order to truly allow our understanding to grow deeper. And because I and you, Joe, we were raised in the West, um, we were also taught about success. And sometimes success means to know a lot and to prove that we are better than others. And that comes with superiority complexes and we are more than you. So why do I have to listen to you? You know, and this kind of mindset is not for everyone, but I, I noticed that in myself when, when I enter into the practice center. And the first teaching that I receive is you have to be open in order to observe and to put into practice. And when I look at that, um, that sentence, I can see, ah, Because if I'm coming in with 
a mind that is already so full and I'm not actually not going to learn anything. I'm just going to look for what I agree to. And I would nod and I would say, yes, I'll do that. But if it's something I'm not agreeing to, then I will not even give it a chance, not even give it an opportunity to enter into me. Then I lose an opportunity. So humility is learning to look with fresh eyes, um, listen with fresh ears and continuing to expand our hearts and knowing that how can we know everything? And there's so much insight and so much wisdom that is alive around us, not even just among the people, among our teachers, among our mentors, among this community, but we also learn to open ourselves to the environment, um, to nature. Um, sometimes I learn to take refuge in the forest and to be little again. Even in my recent trip to Asia, I was in Vietnam and one day I was in a kayak and we went out into the sea. And at one moment it, I got really scared because I just felt so little among this vast ocean and the water became so dark and so deep. And that was so humbling to me to, to just realize that I'm just a small element of this miraculous cosmos. And sometimes we forget how we are all interconnected and we think that we are separated and we are better than others or we are less than others or we're trying to be equal to each other. So these three complexes come into play at a very early stage in a lot of our lives on some people very young, some people a little bit later. And we all have different moments when we meet our complexes and it becomes habits that have a big impact on us. So humility is also an opportunity to look at oneself. And there's this very famous Zen story of, um, of a scholar coming to learn from a Zen master back in China. And um, he went to the Zen master and he asked to have a consultation and the Zen master invited him for tea. But as he was pouring um, the cup of tea for his guest, this is the Zen master, um, he, he was overfilling the cup so the tea was pouring out. And then the young man, the scholar, told the monk, um, teacher, teacher, that's enough, that's enough. You're, you're over pouring um, the tea. And the Zen master looked at him and said, well, it's because you're like that. Your cup is so full. So actually you're not coming to learn anything. Come back to me when you have emptied your cup. Mm, beautiful. And and brother, that, that's very much around the sort of Zen philosophy of a beginner's mind, which is actually always to come back to the start of a journey, that always to recognize that that there's all if, if, that the freshness in us comes from the not knowing it doesn't come from the knowing if we know something as you say we block off but if we just start off right at the beginning saying i don't know as you say then we're open we're flexible we're and and also we're curious i mean i think as human beings we're very curious and when we block off our curiosity that i know it now then actually we're blocking off some deep sort of resonance in us that wants to no more, but it wants to expand our knowledge and our awareness. Exactly. And in the Buddhist psychology um, realm, our stored consciousness, it needs watering. It needs to be re refreshed and reminded. And I remember when Tai taught us how to listen to our Dhamma talk or even how to listen to our sharings, our podcast. You know, Tai always um, tell us, don't come in here like you're coming to a lecture and don't try to be taking notes of everything that I say from time to time. If there is a key element that really resonate or touches your curiosity, just write it down, but you can come back to it later because what I want you to do is to allow yourself to be an open field and let the sharing just enter into your consciousness and it will touch the wisdom inside of you also. So sometimes we're always seeking for insight 
outside of us, but sometimes insight is also alive in each individual and it just needs the right condition for the individual's insight to manifest. But that we need openness or else we're just using our intellectual mind and trying to grasp, grasp an idea that is amazing and awesome or just having a very critical mind and saying yes, no, yes, no to whatever we are listening to. And I think this also trickles into life itself. You know, for us, humility is not only in the learning, but humility is also in the being. So how we be with each other, there's a way that we can easily open ourselves up to each other and connect, or we can also show up with very tense shoulders or a very superiority energy coming in. The, the, even the way we position ourselves in a group is we have to be mindful about that, you know, and as a, as a novice, we were trained how to bow, how to stand, how to sit, how to see each other. And now I look back at all of that training, it taught me not to be stuck in a particular form, but that training gave me the awareness of how my body is also communicating right? Like when I come and I see you, the way I look at you, that is communication already. That that also can has, have the aspect of humility, of humbleness, of like, I want to be here to learn from you. Um, or we can show up and just close our eyes and fake and pretend like we're meditating and not allow anything in. And I've actually have students like that in my own um, years of mentoring and, and teaching class where there are those who show up because they have to come, but because they don't want to be there. So they close their eyes, they shut themselves out. They shut themselves off from the whole community or the whole group. And that's also a lost opportunity. And I like what you point out, Joe, which is curiosity, because in one of the seven factor of awakening is investigation, is we have to have a curious mind we need to explore. We have to explore the world. We have to explore our suffering. We have to explore our happiness. We have to explore ourselves. Why am I sitting here and not having ease? Where is that energy coming from? So this humility is also allowing us to also accept ourselves. Yeah, and and brother, there's there's something you know. Just coming back to one thing you were saying, which is the humility of sort of. I don't know if it, it's humility, but it's that sense of what it is to recognize that everything that needs to unfold in our lives is inwards rather than outwards, and that and that we're we're such in a in a sort of in a Western society of expertise where we go and build up our expertise, and rather than actually build up our inner not knowing. And you know, one of the things I recognize in my coaching practice is all I offer people in one sense is I don't, I don't teach people anything. I don't think there's any point at which we've, it's about looking out at new knowledge or, or have you read this or have you looked at that? But it's just the sort of inner unfolding. It's the inner looking. It's the inner sort of that, that, that we, we cover up our, you know, our, our suffering or our problems with, with layers of, of defensiveness. And actually the humility is to say actually, I, I come to myself open-hearted. I come to myself compassionate. I come to myself with a sort of not knowing. And that actually I, I, I come to myself with a sort of, with a sort of, you know, an, a sort of sense of nakedness that I, I'm open to, to discover what's within me. And so I think, you know, again, it's coming down to the name of the podcast, The Way Out Is In, that, that actually we need to look inwards with humility, not just outwards with humility. Right. And also for me, humility is also allow me to observe. And that's how I learn the quickest is through observation. That's the easiest way for me to learn the Dharma or learn any skill is through observation. And with humility, we have to practice mindfulness because our ego also comes into play, which is touching, you know, self and part of the teachings of Buddhism is learning 
to touch freedom. And when we say freedom, we have to say freedom of what? And a lot of the time, a lot of our ignorance and suffering, it comes from our individualism, our self, our manas um, is a very Buddhist term. And manas here is a layer of our consciousness, which is it, it wants to be loved. It wants to be recognized. It wants to be seen. And it loves pleasure. It loves um, to be satisfied through being called the best, uh, receiving praises, as well as, you know, following into the desire of goodness without recognizing the bait. And our teacher always tells us that we have to be very mindful of what our desire is pulling us towards because our manas has also the tendency to ignore suffering. And so humility sometimes tells us to take a moment before making any decision. It's like, are you sure? You know, there's this quote that Tai always writes from time to time. It's like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to follow down that path? Have you looked deeply enough? And and humility here, um, what where it has allowed me to to practice being free from the self and being free from not being caught in in the power of fame is that everything that I have, everything that I am able to do today, it is not from me. There is an element of fabhu because I am alive. You know, you can see me, you can hear me. But if I start to remove my father, my mother, Plum Village, um, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, even um, my, um, the environment that supports me, you know, you, Joe, you, Kata, um, all of my mentors that were there for me, if I start to remove all of that, then I don't have anything actually. So humility reminds you that even in this moment where you have so much capacity to offer, you're still interconnected to everything else. And that is where it becomes a great support as we navigate through life. And this is where I want to speak on, we also have to have responsibility though. So as a monk, um, as a student of Thai, as a member of the community, as elder brother of many younger siblings in the spiritual family, I can't, I can't um, also use humility as an excuse. For example, like let's say the Sangha asks me to give a Dhamma talk and I say, oh no, please, I'm still a young person. I don't have anything to offer. Um, or I'm so shy, you know, and, and, and I've witnessed this in my beloved community. And I've also seen the tendency of that in me too, to run away from responsibility. But in that moment of accepting a role or accepting the responsibility is also, you are being humble because you're a part of this community. You have to know when to show up, how to show up. And at the same time, you can still be interconnected with the whole community that is there for you. And this is what I've learned from my observation of Thai. I, I think I've shared this story, but I want to share it again because it's so um, relevant to our topic. When I was um, Thai's personal attendant, one day at the Hermitage, um, two sisters came over who were working together with the with Parallax Press, and one of Thai's new book just came out. And they came over to the Hermitage, um, which is where Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh stays. And they had so much excitement. They told Thai, Thai, your new book just came out. Your new book just came out. And, and, I, and I remember one sister said, Tai, fresh off the press, fresh off the press. 
And, you know, the first thing Tai did was he took the book with two hands and he went into his library, his study room, where he writes the books and he put the book on the altar. And then he just prostrated, touching the earth three times. And I followed his action. And, you know, in monasteries and in temples, we all have altars and altars um, is a place that represents our blood and spiritual ancestors. It's a place where we can connect to our roots and the ones who came before us. And, you know, I was very curious when Tai took the book and went into the library. I was like, oh, wait, where's where's Tai going? And he didn't even say anything the moment he received the book. And he just went straight to the library. And after touching the earth three times with Tai, I was so moved. And I didn't say anything, but I knew what, what he was practicing. Tai was practicing no self sharing the merit. Even though this book that he wrote has his name, Thich Nhat Hanh, bold letters, you can see it. But the first thing he did was to honor everyone that came before him, his blood and spiritual ancestors. And I believe at that very moment, he was expressing his gratitude to the Buddha, to his patriarchs, and then to his teacher, thanks to them that he have this spiritual life and this um, spiritual practice to have these wisdom to continue to offer to the world. And in that moment, the ancestors are alive in him. I saw, wow, Tai is practicing sharing the merit that all of this establishment accomplishment at this moment is not just mine, but it's the past, the present, and the future. So that was a very deep moment that I got to witness, and I carry it every day in my life. And even now, every time, you know, we receive gratitude emails and letters for the podcast, you know, I I always join my palm and and express deep gratitude to the past, the present, and the future. But brother, one thing that I think, as you were talking, that came strongly to mind is humility is also about being in service. Because when when we want to be sort of, you know, number one, or we want to be famous, actually, we're the ones who want to stand out. I mean, that's the whole point of fame. It's me, it's me. But actually, humility is about being in service too. And, and I think what we are seeing out in the world is that fame is actually extraction is another form of extraction. We're all trying to extract things to make ourselves look better. Whereas that, and that collectively has created this problem, it's created social injustice, inequality, it's created the climate emergency. Everything is about, it's me, me, and I need, I need more to prove who I am. And service is about community. It's about saying, actually, I'm here for you, not just here for me. And and one thing, brother, uh, when we held this uh, climate leaders retreat last summer, one, one thing you said, which really moved me, um, you were talking about what it is to lead from the front, what it is to lead from the middle, and what it means to lead from the back. And that really moved me because, because we, so we, we often confuse leadership with, with being out in front. I'm the one who's in charge. I'm just follow me. Just do what I say. It will all be okay. But actually, there's this power of leading from the middle, which is saying, actually, how do I hold things together? How do I support the people at the front, but also bring up the people from behind and feel that that there's continuity and that in Zen and in Thai tradition talks about flow as a river rather than a separate. And then there's the power of the person at the back who's making sure that no one gets left behind and making sure that the people who may be trailing um, are, are supported. So, so it'd be great for you to talk about 
service because if I were to say anything about Plum Village, if I was to use one word, it would probably be service. You're in service to um, yourselves. You're in service to helping other people through their suffering. You have service meditation as a core part of the practice. That you, One day you might be cleaning the toilet and the next you might be giving a Dharma talk. So can you give us a flavor of the power of humility in service to life? Yes, I... I have to say, well put, Joe. I, I love how you um, frame it into action because humility is an action also. And I think for myself, service is a way of expressing love. So therefore, humility is also an expression of love, an expression of giving. And I know that when I'm able to give, I receive so much energy back <laughs> and it actually motivates me and it it gives me the fuel and the power to continue to to embrace everything that's happening because being a monk and living in Plum Village there are many moments that is tough it's difficult um there are times when there's so much to do and I get overwhelmed by it and I get lost in my own judgmental mind. I'm like, oh, Fapu, what are you doing? You should be a monk. You should be simple. You should just be sitting there and, and being more still. And then there are moments when um, I feel also so lazy and I feel like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? I should be out there and like helping and so on. And what has been my groundings is to not get lost in the idea of what is better service and what is less better service. So there is this image that um, Tai trains us in to touch into being in the Sangha, which is we're all cells of this body and there are members that is going to play the role of the brain of the of the body there are members are going to be um the hands of the body there are those who are going to be the core of the body and there are those going to be the feet and when all cells and body parts are working in harmony the body is healthy and the body will benefit all all blood cells, all membranes, just the whole physical body. And when I was a novice, we were all trained to work in the kitchen. That is like the first place that we all um, look at an individual to see if they can become a monk or not is how they work in the kitchen. Can they work in harmony? Can they listen? Can they serve? Can they be flexible? Um can they be fast? Because sometimes the idea is like being mindful is very slow, but I'm like, dude, you got to cook and serve 200 people. You can't peel that potato that slow. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, dude, like, can, can you go to gear five right now for us? You know? And, and the kitchen becomes also the heart of the community. The med not only the meditation hall is the heart, but the kitchen, because that's where it feeds everyone. And, I, I've had my years of cooking and I wanted to be a good chef and I realized I'm just not a good chef and I've accepted that, but I'm a good shoe chef. You can tell me uh, and show me how to, to cut anything and I will, I will perform it very well. And so that particular training has also allowed me to, to learn to be so flexible in different ways of life. And I've learned to be the guest master, the work coordinator, even raking the leaves, cutting the grass of the community. I've had the chance to take care of all the toilets, all the dry toilets. Um, even when I was an abbot, I was um, going to dump the, the dry toilets, um, uh, poo poo, <laughs> and, and also urine. And for me at those moments, you know, 
to know that people can use a clean toilet, it just offers me joy. So I don't have any complexes. And that kind of service is also what keeps me very grounded and reminded that the teaching body is not through, not just through words, but, and it's not just through images like, um, like, like sitting on a rock that is very beautiful and, you know, it's a postcard photo of what a monastic should be. And yes, I do have those moments, but I do have moments where I, I want to be in service. I want to roll up my sleeves and help the community do landscape. And we're like, you know, shoveling manure, we're digging holes. And all of that is is actually my deepest joy is that connection with everyone. Um in the, usually in the spring we have community work day so we we ask everyone to put aside their personal roles for the community and we do a few projects together it, it may be a very small project but um these kind of service and and even that moment you know we're all confronted with each other we usually do this gathering and the work coordinator explains the the task for today and everyone can feel important and everyone can say, yeah, but I'm doing this for the Sangha. So I'm not going to show up for that. And, you know, like, and, you know, and, and I'm a victim of that. I've, I've done that a few times. I've said, oh, you know, dear community, I need to do this. It's very important. And of, of course, because I say it, everybody's like, yes, yes, it should. Of course it is. But when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just playing myself. I'm just making myself important. And so the way we construct our daily life in organization, in communities, it's very important to, to, to not lose our beginner's mind, Joe, what you said at the beginning. Like when I first came, what was my, what were some of my greatest joy? Cutting the grass for the community. Um, I, I, I have this one experience with Tai as his attendant. We, we do, which we want to do everything for him, but he's very careful about that because um, Tai is was very independent and he also likes to do things on his own. And there was one day we're in the sitting still hut where we are recording this podcast right now. And Tai was in the restroom, in the toilet, and I walked by it and I just heard, shuk, 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 shuk. and I'm like, what is Tai doing? And as a naughty little novice, I peek my head in the toilet. Um, I, I don't know if I should, should have been doing that or not, <laughs> but I was for sure Tai was not using the toilet. So, And Tai was washing his socks by hand. And my first reaction is I said, Tai, let, let us do this for you. You don't need to do this because in my mind, I'm like, Tai, you're a Zen master of the world. Like, you're you're our spiritual leader. Don't you shouldn't be waste you shouldn't be quote unquote wasting your time doing this. And you know, Tai just turned and he gave me this big smile. And Tai just said, But Tai enjoys doing this. And of course, I just backed off and Tai continued to wash his socks. And I just realized that even for Tai, he had moments activities in the day, in the week, in the month that he would continue to do in order to keep him very close to all of us. Like for me to see him wash socks by himself, that's a teaching in itself. And this continued through the tours. Like we were in the USA, we we're staying at um, at universities where we we're hosting retreats or even at hotels. I would even see Tai wash his socks. So I, I picked on um, a few of that in order to incorporate from my own life to, to, to be reminded that I can do things that serve myself as well as serve others that are very simple um, and, and that keeps me closer to people. Thank you, Fapu. And, and there were a couple of things that came to mind as you were speaking. One was, and you mentioned earlier about the superiority complex. And there's this sort of mistake that 
what we're doing, we see in relation to what other people are doing and think it's maybe more important. So to give you a couple of examples, um, when I worked at The Guardian, um, a lot of the journalists were quite arrogant because they thought, you know, they are the journalists, they're the voice of the newspaper. And often, or not often, but occasionally I would see them not treating the facility staff with respect, like the people who were cleaning the toilets, the people who were keeping the lights on, the people who were uh, making, you know, the food. And I had this sort of real sense of the discrimination within that. Because actually, yes, it's true, the journalists are the voice that goes out and people then respond to. But actually, if the cleaners weren't there cleaning out, making sure the toilets were working, there was no food and there was no lighting, and there was no printing presses, printing off the newspaper, or now no uh, tech staff getting the stuff, there wouldn't be any journalism. And, And it's such a mistake, actually, to believe that one job is more important. And, and we see that in society, don't we? We see that, that the billionaires or the sort of people in finance making loads of money thinking they're very important. And then they're nurses who are de- creating extraordinary work who are not respected in the same way financially and often struggle to make a living. And um, I had this experience myself actually very sharply when I arrived in, to live in Plum Village three years ago and I was in a sharing circle and um, and we started going around the circle, and I think the first question was, "What what, what is what are you doing? You know, what what are you doing in life or whatever?" And and I was a little bit, I, I mean, I don't think I sounded pompous, but I felt it a little bit pompousness within me. Well, you know, I'm working on international climate, and I'm working doing this, and I'm doing that, and 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 it, you know, sounding quite you know important work. And then the next person this person sitting around next to me who then went next was working on on the happy farm the in plum village the 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 farm and he said my ambition oh it was about ambition so i said i want to help you know save the world sort of thing and he said i i want to i want to grow beautiful vegetables and that was his ambition and and at that very moment i recognized that what his ambition was to create beautiful vegetables for the community was no more or less or, or the same. So there's neither superior, neither inferior, to neither equality. It wasn't the same as what I'm doing. And that actually we all make our own contribution and not to, not to judge that contribution as being my contribution is more important. Because as you say, everyone's contribution is based on everyone else's and we are a constellation of change we're all we're all making our small mark in the world and the other thing that came to my mind brother was was what that we can use humility as you said in a way of excusing things or or belittling ourselves but actually there's something about i think and i'm not sure if this is humility so i'll check in with you on it but what i was thinking of was about when you said actually i recognize i i'm not going to be a good chef is that it's very easy to think, oh, actually, that's my weakness. I need to strive to become a good chef. And it takes so much time and energy to become a good chef that actually you lose what you're actually good at, which is being the abbot of Plum Village and, and holding the community together. And sort of, you know, I realize this very much in my working life, whereas my, my greatest weakness is organization and timekeeping and planning and so, and but what I'm very good at is being with people and and having ideas and and bringing people together and da, da. and when I was a lot younger, I was putting so much energy into the sort of the planning, the timekeeping, trying to get better at the things I just was not naturally good at. And I recognise, yes, I need to be responsible, but actually, the amount of energy it was taking was drawing me away from my other part of me, which was which was where I feel my, my most, where I feel I can give my most. So I think there's a humility also to recognizing one's skills or what, what one can offer and not be caught in the striving of, I need to be better at this, or I need to be better at that, but actually recognizing the humility of recognizing who we are and not feeling we need to be more than that. Beautifully put. And I, I want to add that um, 
that was when I asked Tai, Tai, what do I do as an abbot? You know, because when I became abbot, there was no manual. There still is no manual, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I didn't know what I was supposed to do as an abbot. Um, so I asked Tai, Tai, so what am I supposed to do? And he said, "You need to learn to see the talent in the community, and allow those talent to flourish, so that their roots can can take root in the field of the kisanga, so that they can feel a part of this community." And that was such a beautiful image that he gave me. And so it told me that I didn't have to be the boss of everyone, and I didn't have to make anyone better than anyone else or even equal. But each seed, each member, will have a way to flourish in the sangha. But a skillful leader, or a skillful mentor, or just brother or friend, is someone who can also. Water the good seeds in the person, and because because sometimes we we may have a bird's eye view of what that person's capacity is rather than the individual. Because sometimes we have blind size, right? We we can't see our own uh, strength or weaknesses, and we need support from from each other um, to flourish. So that also helped me. Break free from this idea that we all should be the same. Also, because I, I'm not gonna lie. Like you know, it's so easy when when you think you're great, like when you think you're good, like you're a good practitioner, and you you think everybody should be modeled the same. And the word training is wonderful, but it can also be a trap sometimes. Like we're training everyone to be exactly the same. There's also a danger in that. Is actually no where. We're training in the same foundation, which is the practice of mindfulness, the practice of understanding, of love, of concentration, of insight, of a collective awakening. But we're all going to grow differently. And just very recently, I was um, in Vietnam and I was speaking to a very wonderful friend who um, is a CEO of of a company, and. We were both talking about. We we're asking each other questions like uh, how our organization works and so on. And at that moment, whenever I get into these conversation, I always feel like I have to be in a row of giving advices or like giving opinion. But I realize at that moment, I'm still very young, and my friend. Is much older than me and have a lot of experience, and she was sharing to me with a very beautiful, open heart in the way how she has incorporated a lot of the Plum Village teaching into her business and her um, her team. And there was a part of me I was always trying to look for something to sound better <laughs> and to sound a little bit wiser. Mm. And at that very moment, you know, I I saw myself. I saw my own mind, and I saw my own manas, and I saw my own wanting to be recognized. And I just let it go, and I just sat there, and I just had such an open mind, and I just listened, and I received so much from that um, sharing. And and funny enough, what she was sharing to me was that she's learned from. Mindfulness is that we're all not the same, <laughs> and that we we all have to see the talent and also also recognize the weaknesses, so that we put people in the right place, so that they can flourish rather than being then because they can't do something, then the inferiority complexes come up. So it's such an interesting um, this openness and listening and humility. How much we can continue to learn. And for all of us who are who are OI members who have received the 14 mindfulness trainings, please remember that humility and openness is one of our trainings. That we're always learning in life. We're always observing and and growing as long as we keep our eyes, our mind, and our hearts open. 
And and brother, just to add one more thing to that, um, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about leadership, and often people who are an expert or people who are good at something or people in charge of something, when they see someone coming up who maybe has a talent better, bigger than theirs or better than theirs, there's often this wish to push them down, to see them as a challenge, to see it as a threat because, and we'll get to fame shortly, but the, the sense of wanting to stay on top of things and therefore someone else who might be shining their light is a threat to us. And and for me, humility and leadership is about recognizing that actually everyone has a talent. And when you see a talent, you should basically be be supporting that talent, even if it makes you look like you're because actually people have such a narrow view of what leadership is that, you know, when if someone's seen to support other people in in raising their talents and and putting themselves not as number one all the time. That is such a powerful thing to do. And I, you know, you talk about stages of life. I'm now uh, 61. And, you know, and I, I think when we get to fame, let's talk about age, because actually there, there are stages in life where, where we're different. And, and my wish now is to support people to be their best. And it's not about being me being out in the front. It's about actually that I get such joy and, um, and satisfaction from seeing, you know, people I'm working with blossom and and shine forth and be able to be more than who they thought they were. You know, it's such a beautiful gift to, you know, while I'm, I have my own needs, that's where I feel my best. The gift is that I am in service to them. So, brother, why did you want to start off with humility, by the way, first? Because I thought I, I was thinking we'd start off with fame. And, and I thought that's that's actually really interesting that because the, the, the tendency is to go to the to the energy of fame first. And you went to humility. So before we go into humility, hit fame, rather, what, what <laughs> made you pick up on humility to go first? Because I want to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk. Well, I think because that quality is what I am still cultivating today. Yeah. And it's it's something that I remind myself every morning. Hmm. Good. So let's go into uncultivating fame. <laughs> because, because fame is like a drug. Mm. And as you say, it's like a hook. It's like there's such a desire within us to stand out, to be different, to be recognized, to be loved, to be appreciated. And, and Western society particularly, but also elsewhere, values sort of that the way to get love, the way to get attention is to be able to consume, is to be able to be shining bright and to be often more than who we are. This, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, this, this wish to be more than ourselves at this point. So um, I'm just wondering, brother, whether we should start out by um, talking about our experiences of fame and uh, minor as it might be. But I know for you, um, watching you over the last uh, 17 years I have from a sort of very young monk to now the abbot and seeing you increasingly respected people with especially with Thai passing you're now seen as you know a senior member of the monastic um order of plum village you're becoming more in demand people recognize you you might be walking through an airport and people say oh that's brother fapu so there, there's that sort of sense of fame and respect coming your way and you're still young at 35 so maybe it would be worth each of us maybe giving a bit of a sharing about how fame, how we how we see fame, how we deal with fame. Uh, we are not A celebrities, B celebrities. We're Z celebrities in our own way. But 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 
within our worlds we're known and to some extent respected. So um, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? You you can go first, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what I've experienced it as, it is a drug. So one, you know, when I started out as a journalist, there was nothing I wanted more than my name to be on the front page. And actually, when I look back at that, you know, when I was that age, it was not the quality or the actual story that was most important, although, of course, that was important, but it was the fact that my name was on the story and my name was on the front page and my name was in big letters and then I could share it and show everyone that I was on the front page of the Daily Telegraph or the Guardian or whatever. And... And what I saw also is how many of the journalists would fight over getting their byline. So if they, if, and if someone's name was left off a story, how much they got upset by it. So I recognize in that, that while so many journalists I know I have so much respect for because they do want to bring truth and light to dark corners of the world and to inform and to entertain and educate. There's also a fragility in, in the ego of wanting to be shown up. And over the years, what I, what I recognize is that the best way to get your name known is to write about controversial things and write about what's going wrong rather than what might be inspirational, what might be going right. And there was such a sort of, um, and that regardless of the impact of a story, if you got an exclusive story, you wanted to publish it. And there is obviously very, very good reasons for that. But there were occasions where I recognized that actually, if I published a story at a particular time, that it would do a lot of damage to something that I thought was really important. And it wasn't that I hid the information, because, but it was that there was a responsibility to me to say, how can I craft a story in a way that it will show the truth, but also can angle towards creating positive change? So I did notice that path of me move from it's all about me, it's about my name, it's about I'm the great journalist because I got that story, to what is responsible journalism. But the the other thing was more sort of personal, which was, um, and there are a couple of examples of that. Um, I remember there was one time where um, I was chairing, asked to chair a conference in Amsterdam, and it was a major conference, and I was the, the, the chair, it was about, 12, 1300 people, and I was chairing it over two days. And I arrived at the conference with a colleague of mine from The Guardian. And literally, as I arrived, I was walking down and someone came up and said, oh my God, can I take a picture with you? And then we walked down a bit further and someone said, oh my God, could I have your autograph? And I remember the guy, my colleague turned to me and said, God, you're really famous. And I remember at that point feeling so attracted to that feeling that I walked into this big place. I was recognized. People would come up to me and ask me for my photograph or my autograph. People would see me as important. And what I realized in that moment is the desire to be more than me. That actually what fame did was open up a supersized version of me that I could let go. In. And in that place, I had no insecurities, no sense of um, doubt that I was bigger than myself. And it, it was a very, very wonderful feeling. It felt really amazing. I'm, I'm well known. I'm not just one of the crowd I'm standing out, I'm important. And then you stand in front of 1,200 people and you, you sort of, you run the, that, the, the event and, and that builds on that. And luckily for me, I really caught that because I recognized that actually what it was actually doing was taking me away from myself and creating a gap between who I really am and the person I would then be pretending to be. And that that would need defending and protecting. 
because if I let it go, then you know the, 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 it would like be a, like a pin in a balloon, and I would come back to my small self, and it would be a disaster. So I recognized in that that actually that what fame does is actually not only does it take us away from who we are, but it means it's very very difficult to go back because it feels like collapse, it feels like failure, it feels like oh my god, I'll have to deal with all my problems. So actually, it was a, it there was a huge escape in it. And I remember it was such a strong feeling, even though it was a tiny little thing. I mean, for most people who are famous, you know, they get this every second of the day. But it was such a tiny thing, but it was so strong in me that the way I felt I had to almost exorcise it from myself was that I just had to tell people the story. I went around for the next week telling people, you never guess what happened to me. You know, I, I had this feeling and it felt like this, and but I realized it's false. And I realized that actually that's not who I really am. And, and almost I had to keep telling the story to let go of the need that had, the, the let, as you described, let go of the hook. And, and the only other thing I would mention is that, um, and I, I wrote an article about it at the time, I was invited to, um, it's, it was a World Congress on Nature by an organization called the IUCN, and I traveled to Sydney, Australia for this. And when I arrived, um, normally I'm, you know, you're a press delegate, so that's, you know, you, that sets you a little bit apart, makes you important. But I got a VIP um, badge, which I'd never re- received before at that time, and and I remember, you know, it had you, you wear the the, thick, the lanyard around your neck, and it had big VIP, and so I would walk around uh, thinking, wow, I'm a VIP, and and then because I'm a VIP, I was allowed into a place where the food was a much better quality. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 to mix in 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 just where the VIPs would meet, so you could meet more important people. And then I noticed that there was another badge, which was a black badge for really really big VIPs, and that they got even better food, and that they got even more sort of attention. And I and I wrote an article about this, about the the falsity in that, and and I I referred to. Um, a Dr. Zeus book called, I think it's something like Sneetches on the Beaches. And it's about these characters, and they're two, two groups of characters. They're the same, exactly the same, except one group has a star on their chest and the other one doesn't. And the ones with stars on their chest feel so important, and they're all, always partying, and the other ones with no stars feel dejected and, and, and excluded. And then this character comes along and offers to, for $5 to give the characters without stars put stars on upon theirs. So they all go through this machine and they get stars on them. And then the ones who actually had the stars originally get really upset because they're no longer important or special. And so they pay $5 to go and get their stars taken off. And this guy's just making money because they're all racing in and out, getting stars on, getting stars off, until they're all completely exhausted. And then they all look at each other and realize actually they're exactly the same. And that the star on their chest or not on the chest was just, was, was, was not real, was not important. And that was a really important story when I read it, because it, I think it, it tells the truth of this, that, that fame, there's nothing to it. In fact, it creates suffering. It creates harm. It creates a sense of hollowness. And it creates such a pressure to maintain, because once you've got it, you've got to maintain it. And I still have that a little bit. You know, I still want that sort of recognition. There's part of me that still wants to stand out. There's part of me that still wants to be respected. And and I recognize that, you know, that comes from, you know, some deep insecurities on me and also a human condition to, to want to be recognized. And so, and so this is always a work in progress, actually, because, because that hook is is dangling there. It's not like, oh, the hook gets suddenly taken away and I never have to deal with it again. And, you know, the podcast is a good example where we get such amazing feedback, you know, saying this changes people's lives. And and I'm doing something very similar to you, Fapu, which is I read it and I, I'm no longer hooked by it, by thinking, wow, I'm doing this or I'm helping people that I'm I'm wise and I'm doing this. I think, what I'm able to do is to help share these deep teachings from thousands of years ago that still resonate. And actually, I, all I am is a vehicle and a channel to help these teachings reach 
maybe new audiences or to or to help reach people in new ways. So anyway, sorry that was a bit of a monologue, but that was um, that's just sort of how I've been affected or working by it. And I, and actually, I feel really, I, th- I think it must be so difficult for real celebrities, you know, for mm. people who are so well known that they step out their door and they're being photographed, that they're chased everywhere, that they, you know, that they may get lots of benefits from it. But oh my god, you know, it feels such a life of suffering from my perspective. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe, for opening your heart and sharing this publicly and honestly. Oh, why not? Um, we're not we're not publishing this, are we? <laughs> of course, we are. <laughs> now, this, this this is this is this is a real training. Learning to be transparent and and be humble to ourselves to even yeah. say things like that, right? Yeah. Um, luckily, for me, I didn't start with the intention to become a monk to be famous. So that wasn't like a seed that that was planted when I joined the monastic path. Like, like I just wanted to shave my head and wear that brown robe and <laughs> and be able to feel like I was a part of you know Plum Village. Like that was like my real motivation. And of course, part of our training and the teachings of the Buddha and the teachings of Thai, um, it always talks about being mindful of um, power, money, fame, and sensual pleasure. And I guess like when I was young, I was just, uh, I was like, oh yeah, dude, we'll never, like we won't have to deal with fame, you know, like we're, we're just monastics. We're just nobodies and 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 we're just home. Um, we're learning to be homeless. We're learning to be like less and less and less. Um, but I think now to also be totally honest is when I first realized that people recognize me without me knowing them, there was a lot of feelings there. Like someone came up to me in Plum Village, like on arrival day of a retreat and they came and they bowed to me with a lot of enthusiasm and this, and they shared that, um, how grateful they are to have the chance to listen through the podcast through the two um, through the pandemic and now through their commutes and everything. And they said, and I feel like I know you. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I feel very naked right now. <laughs> and I I didn't know how to react. So I just draw my palm and I just I think I bowed and I said, thank you for supporting the podcast and enjoy your week <laughs> with us in Plum Village. Um and and I did have to go for a walk. Like I went into nature and I was just like, whoa, okay, this is new. This is something you can't also push away. Because in that moment, it wasn't, they weren't coming to me because of something I'm not also. You know what I mean? It's like, there's also like that view, that respect um to the teachings that they are able to listen to and so i remembered in 2008 i had the chance to go with tai to india and i was his attendant tai gave us a prep talk before arriving in india to the whole delegation of monks and nuns because there's a culture of respect in india that when they meet someone on a spiritual path whether they are a buddhist monk or maybe a guru, um, they will touch the earth before you. They will prostrate before you and they would put their hands on our feet in order to receive that blessing. And Tai said, at that moment, you're not allowed to reject that respect and that prostration. But what you have to practice at that moment is that what they are bowing to is not you, but it's what you represent. It's the robe, it's the bald head, it's the monastic vow that you took. It's that you are a part of the Buddha's lineage and the spiritual lineage that has been transmitted for over 2,600 years. So what they're prostrating to is that. 
it's not you, you know? And Tai was, when he said that, like, he pointed his fingers, like, it's not you. They are prostrating and paying gratitude to the lineage, the ancestors that have gone before us and what we are representing now. And then Tai, Tai gave us a practice and Tai said, and if anything, that should encourage us to, to practice even more deeply in order to represent that spirituality, that represent mindfulness, concentration, insight, and peace, you know? So when I was walking in the forest after that person um, bowed to me, that, that, that line of Thai came up very strong and I felt very immature at that moment of the way I um, received that, um, that love. Um, and so I, I vow that I would practice better next time uh, when somebody do that, you know, just to also offer my gratitude back for, for practicing, you know, and I, and I thank them for being a part of the community and so on. And, and, and for taking in the practice that Tai has transmitted and that we are now offering. And another part of me is being scared, to be honest, because with a lot of respect and a lot of admiration and a lot of recognition, I just realized that all of my actions have really powerful consequences. You know, I'm very mindful of what I post. <laughs> I'm very mindful of um, how I interact, how I share. And I guess there were moments in me when I was like, am I losing who I am? You know, and that becomes a bell of mindfulness for me to reflect on. So in, instead of being too scared of it and, and making it um, um, like something dark and heavy, I'm, I'm turning it into a koan, like a question to just reflect and just be mindful of my own mind of what I'm cultivating. Because sometimes it's, maybe it's just our perceptions. Like maybe nobody cares about us and we, and, and we are just creating our own story about who we are also, right? So what I'm practicing is no matter where I am, when I meet someone, I will look at them in the eye and I will see them for who they are. I will recognize that they are there in front of me and not to not to allow the ego um, to say, oh, they should be respecting me more, you know, to have this sense of privilege or whatever that may be. Um, and that sneaks in with the energy of fame, you know, all of this other weeds that come up with it, which is like expecting people to treat you a particular way or, or even in, in my own community, my monastic community, um, I just had the chance to go to Thailand, um, our Plum Village community in Thailand, Plum Village International Thailand. It's such a beautiful center. Oh my gosh. I, I haven't been back in six years. And when I arrived, like how much love and work does community have put in to the landscape and the energy there is so warm and it's so beautiful. But many of the new younger brothers have never have never met me. And many of the new younger sisters in the community have never met me. And of course, through the pandemic, um, there are times that we exchange Dhamma talks, we, uh, we, we Zoom in to see each other. But now it was the first time of seeing each other in person. So, you know, there was some excitement, there was some of that energy, that, like, like um, bubbly energy, you know. So, 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 so I think my practice is just, you know, just being mindful of it and also not pushing it away, you know, of just like, also just embracing it with humility, <laughs> with like, it's not just you, but it's what you represent and everything. So for me, that has been um, a constant reflection and, and something that I am in touch with and uh, something that I also don't want to be a victim of success. And and it brings me back to this quote, you know, that I... Um, shared to this um, business leader that he met in 2013 uh, when that businessman asked Tai, well, actually Tai asked that businessman, uh, which was, um, 
what do you think is more important, success or happiness? And that businessman、um, answered both. And Tai said, "No, you have to pick one." And I don't think the businessman answered. So Tai said, "You can be a victim of your success, but you will never be a victim of your happiness." And this happiness is a deeper happiness because we may think success is happiness, but this happiness is the happiness of fulfillment of feeling we have. Contributed. We are interconnected. We, we have love inside of us. We have love around us.、Uh, we are able to support someone. So all of us, we have to define and meditate on what it means is our happiness. And and that that quote has become very alive for me、um, because I I do have a lot of projects going on right now in this present moment that we are planning for this year. 2023, as well as projecting 24, 25, and it all is to bring the Dharma to、um, to different places, as well as continue to、um, create retreats for people to come to Plum Village,、uh, and so on. And I even ask myself, like, am I becoming a victim of those success, or am I actually enjoying the process, enjoying the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the siblinghood, while we're all creating this together? And what I have、um, been practicing is also delegating, like delegating a responsibility and and roles to my brothers and sisters, and to make sure that I don't ever fall into the trap like I'm the only one that can do this. So I think when you become known and you're very respected, you can also become a victim of that, of like you are Superman, like. Things won't work without you, and you know the second seal of Plum Village, Dharma Seal Plum Village, is go as a river, and as a drop of water in this river, I can maybe be seen at the head, but there are moments I want to be at the middle just to be the bridge to connect the、um, the younger generation and the elder generation, or at the bridge to connect. The different cultures in our community, or sometimes I love it when I can just take a step back and sit and take refuge in my elders that are also there in front of me. So, the beauty of that insight is, you're always among a stream of water. That there are gonna be those in front of you, and there are those behind you, and there are those around you.、Um, and if you just let go of your Of your pride and just release the the barrier a little bit, you will feel so much more supported, and and you will feel less alone. And I think a lot of us、um, who are famous and who will fall into those realms, I think you can feel very alone.、Um, and it's also because of what we create in our own perception of of who we are, rather than. Just being who we are, and also allowing others to support us.、Um, so I think that's that's one thing I can share right now,、um, Joe. And maybe in five years from now, when you ask me that question, it'll be different, you know, because、um, mm. we're we're ever changing, we're always changing, and we're always growing from the practice. But I that that's how I'm practicing right now. Thank you, brother. And, and one of the things which you sort of, in a sense, mentioned there is fame often creates loneliness. It creates separation. That if you're at the top of something, or you're the leader of something, or you're the CEO, or, or whatever it is, that actually that's in my experience of interviewing people and being with people, that that's often the most lonely place. Yeah. And it's a place where you where you don't know who you can trust. If you're famous, you know one of the biggest issues seems to be who who can I trust? Who who's after my money? Who wants to be associated with my fame? Who wants to steal attention 
from me? Who wants to do this? And, and it, actually, that's a place of real potential loneliness. And, and one of the things I love, you know, about living next door to Plum Village is, is that it's a community that you can reach out. You can admit to, this is what I'm going through. This is my suffering. You can share this. And it doesn't become this journey of loneliness and separation and then defensiveness, protection, attack, judgment, etc. That that can lead from that. But brother, I think perhaps this was my most important question to you today, which is that we one of the feedbacks from um, our listeners was uh, one of them was saying that that the that the being that particularly enjoys listening to you is their cat, and um, and and the fact is that that Ty always brought in you know human beings and all living all living beings, not just humans. So I'm I'm just wondering if maybe there's a risk of you um, becoming famous around the feline world and whether, whether how you're going to deal with that when they all come purring up to you. Because I know I have noticed in Plum Village, there are a couple of cats who like to come and sort of um, rub against your legs. I'm just wondering whether we we are missing a, missing a big issue here about how you're going to cope with your feline fame. I don't think we have to worry about that. Cats are very independent. (laughs) They will come to you when they're lacking a little bit of love, but when they have enough, they know how to be by themselves. Um, I I, I do want to add one one element that I've been practicing is because when when you start to become recognized, like I think we, we focus too much then on our outer show, like, you know, like how we show like our outer form, like what we're wearing, how we show up and what, what we need to say and so on. And very recently, um, I had a gathering of young wake uppers in Vietnam and one of the, uh, the university student, uh, he was so eager to meet me. He's like, he said, I'll, I'll skip school to, uh, to, to, to come and have a cup of tea with you. So I said, okay, please come. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry, school. Um, <laughs> but, you know, w- after the sharing, um, we had a little bit of a Q&A and he asked me, he's like, brother, like, I have a lot of inferiority complexes about my physical form and I, I feel so much smaller than other people and like, how do I work with that? And that question was me when I was 12 years old, when I was 13 years old. And it brought back so much memory of my childhood because I'm also very small, a petite person. And I did tell him, I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not that big. But one thing that we can always grow and develop is our heart is our capacity of love and our capacity of being there for others. And I did share, like, I've had the wonderful privilege of being around Tai. And for me, he is as big of a superstar (laughs) as, 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 as for me, like who I, I feel like the greatest honor in my lifetime to, to walk next to, to sit next to. And what he always offered was his unconditional presence, you know, his way of just being, his open heart, his his way of looking at me, his way of um, seeing me. And I said, you know, outer form is impermanent, but our capacity of love, that can be transmitted lifetime. Just like the teaching of the Buddha, it continues today to and I believe Tai's legacy will continue for year, hundreds of years to come. So our um, our greatest offering, I always come back to, is the kindness, the openness, the the way of being. So I think for me, if I want to be known uh, and be remembered, is 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 also that. It's like where do I shift? Like what do am I cultivating? What am I investing in? So that I'm offering, like what we said, humility is also offering. So if you have an impact, what are you offering to the young generation? What are you offering to um, people around you? What are you offering to society? And what I want to share is that if you're famous, 
wonderful, it's great. But how can you use your presence to have an impact that can last, outlast you, you know, and that can can be um, remembered and cultivated in the next generation? And I think people don't remember your names, but they remember your actions and your presence. Mm, brother, that's so beautifully put, and and it really brings to the center of my attention how Ty dealt with his fame, because we're talking about how we deal with it. But but the great example is Ty himself, because Ty, I think I might have mentioned this before, I refer to him as the most famous person no one's ever heard of, because it's like so many people know about him, but they know about him from the essence rather than from an outer manifestation of who he is. And I, I always remember... Um, when I was at The Guardian, I, I, I was told, well, I heard that the Daily Mirror, which is a sort of tabloid popular newspaper in the UK, wanted to do a feature on Ty because he was coming to the UK to do a tour. And that they asked the Plum Village community for all the pictures of him with famous people. Because actually what the Daily Mirror wanted to do was have a photo spread of famous people and Ty was a way of giving them that opportunity. And I remember the monastics looked and they couldn't find a single one. And so they went back to the mirror and said, well, you know, we, we, we don't have any uh, photos of him with famous people, but, but we'd love you to do an article. And they said, oh, well, well then we'll, we'll, we're not interested. We'll drop the idea. And um, my, my wife, Paz, who's been in different tr Buddhist traditions and has seen firsthand where where people's fame has got out of control and, and become abusive. Um, she, she's always said that Thai, the, the, the Sangha, so the community around Thai, reflects the teacher. The teacher reflects the community and the community reflects the teacher. And, and what I love about the community that is attracted to Thai is that so many of them, well, all of them, I've, I've never met someone who comes to Plum Village or someone who cares about Thai's teaching to be a show off or to be someone who's parades their, their clothes, you know, people come, it's a very honest Sangha in my experience. And, um, it was a real insight from that. I learned from Paz about saying, well, actually, if the teacher is in any way corrupt or it will show up in the community or in the, in the other monastics. And, um, and I think, you know, spirituality is such a delicate and vulnerable area because often people come to a spiritual community because they might be broken, they they might be suffering, they might be searching for help, and and they, it can easily create a, a power situation where the where the where the, in any spiritual tradition the the person who has a so called spiritual wisdom or knowledge looks as though they 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 have a deeper understanding of life and therefore the person who comes to them become can easily become dependent and uh, and needy and think that that person is special because actually they've got something that the person is looking for and therefore it can easily that can easily create a a place of abuse and and I think Thai's community pretty much I mean most of the time I have not seen that um that corruption of spirit in the community. So, so, it, but it might be helpful, Fapu, just to talk a bit about how you see Thai have handling. You know, he was he was invited by presidents, prime ministers. He was invited in all sorts of you know by some of the most powerful CEOs in the world. How did he handle that? His sangha, what he created. Um, this community is that he lived in it and he didn't build, you know, his own mansion somewhere else. And, you know, you know, he always flew economy. Um, so the way you choose your way of life around you will support your practice, you know, and, and, and there were moments when, when because of circumstance, you know, we, we did have to be in a little bit more of a, luxurious car in different countries or so on. But when we return back to Plum Village, it's still that Toyota hybrid, you know? <laughs> and when 
Tai comes back to Plum Village is still that sitting still hut that the mattress is very close to the ground. Um, in his hut is a bookshelf made from bricks and a pe- and three piece of log that his table that he's had for, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years. And he, he cultivates his lifestyle to support his true intention, which is simplicity. And I think that is where your lifestyle also becomes your temple. You know, it becomes your practice. And the mind is also cultivated by how you condition yourself. So if you're going to condition yourself by simplicity, then, then you're always reminded to not fall into desire, into more and more and more. And what I what I truly respect in Thai, and I am I I still am trying to do it, is um, he's just so committed to the schedule of the community. You know, throughout all my years of his of attending him, we would be on like an intensive tour in the United States for two and a half months straight where Tai probably gave over 40 Dhamma talks and interviews and so on. And if we arrive like today is Saturday and tomorrow is Sunday, which is a traditional day of mindfulness in Plum Village, Tai will show up, give the Dhamma talk, lead the walking meditation, lead the formal lunch, and then rest afterwards. So it just shows me that Everything that he does, there's no difference. You, you know what I mean? It's like that's his way. That's him being the drop of water in the river. There's no difference in like, oh, I just came from afar. I'm so exhausted. You all need to respect me. Da, da, da. Like there's none of that. I, I and I just came back from Vietnam <laughs> a, few, a few days ago, and and you know we were setting up to record this podcast, and we we're all like. For me, I was like trying to select the right time and so on. But sometimes when I get caught up, I just I'm reminded of Tai's aspiration, his will, his bodhisattva energy, which is like it's more than me. And and I think that insight of interbeing is what really um, has also kept Tai so close to all of us. And I think that was one of the uniqueness of Tai is that. He's so extraordinary, but he's so ordinary. And there, is, and there are things that he does that is so ordinary, but it's so extraordinary. You know, like I've received so many guests that have had lunch with Tai, have had tea with Tai, and Tai shares the same table with everyone. If we're eating on the floor, Tai's eating on the floor. And there was this one OI member who later on became a monastic with us. Um, one day, Tai invited her for breakfast because he wanted to express his gratitude to her for help organizing um, the German tour when Tai went to Germany back in the early 2000s. And through the whole meal, she was just crying. <laughs> she didn't even eat anything. And Tai just said, why aren't you eating? Like, aren't you hungry? And she's just like, no, I just want to watch you. <laughs> But, you know, like I think for her to witness Tai be so ordinary, but so present and so alive was extraordinary for her. You know, so I think that that has been um, a compass for me, like to be ordinary. And there are moments of extraordinary in it. And if you're ever extraordinary, just be ordinary because... You still want to be so connected to everyone. Like, what's the point of being great but having no friends, you know? Like, what's the point of being all this and that but not having time for your loved ones? And I think it's very cliche to say that. And I know in a lot of movies and a lot of, I don't know, um, quotes says that. But it is real. And I think that's why it has been transmitted through so many generations of, of, of this wisdom. It's like, 
take time to be with each other because our life is so impermanent. We we think we live long, but I don't know. One day we all we turn back to the earth and let's let's live fully, you know. And that's why this mindfulness practice and people learning to come back and be true to themselves and be home to be at home with themselves in order to be home with others is so important. Oh, brother, that's so beautifully um, spoken. And it, it um, you know, we, we hear these stories of stars throwing hissy fits when the green room doesn't have white, particular white flowers or blue M&Ms and, and all those, as you say, are separation. And, and I, I see that also in you, brother, you know, and that you come in and you, you know, when it's setting up the meditation, all you're there moving the cushions and mats and, and it's a grounding. And I, and I, you know, I, in my own way, do that because I recognize, you know, when I go and facilitate or chair something, I will go in early and I will move all the chairs around to get it right. I won't say, why did you set this up or you come and do this? Because I think there's something so important about just being grounded, you know, that when the sound technician is there to be with the sound technician, getting it right, not telling the sound technician what to do, not to tell the people to move the chairs, but to move it with them, to be part of everything. Because it grounds me, it respects them, I actually get what I want, and it and it, it grounds me in that place, in that physical place. So when I then chair or facilitate something, I'm already there. And I think when, you know, when, when people come into conferences, they, they, they fly in and they come in halfway through the conference, get, deliver their 10 minutes and then leave. What are they delivering? Who are they connecting with? They haven't been there. They don't know the people. They haven't spent time there. They don't know the physicality. They come to deliver something and go. And that, what are they really doing there? They're just, they're just delivering something, but they're not being there. So I really hear that. Um, brother, maybe this is a good place to stop. Um, and I love that to have the extraordinary in the ordinary and the ordinary in the extraordinary. That that's a good one, brother. I love that phrase because that that I haven't heard someone voice it like that. And I think it 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 beautifully sums up what we've been discussing today. So um so thank you so much. And uh as tradition, we uh have a short Meditation, which is, um, as you say, in, in Plum Village tradition, there's this idea of Dharma rain. We can now let go of all the words and um, come back to this moment, letting everything else go. And just to, um, for all the cats that are here and listening, um, please enjoy the dulcet tones of Fat Poo's meditation. And dear friends, wherever you may be listening from, if you are on the airplane, on a train, on a bus, in a car, or going for a jog, going for a walk, or cleaning your house, or doing your chores, whatever you may be doing, just allow yourself to take a moment to pause. You can find a bench, find a seat, or you can even lay down if you're near a park. And just allow your body to rest. Just feeling your shoulders drop. Releasing the tension in your arms. If you are holding a fist, let's undo the fist. Letting our fingers, our palms relax and open. Let us feel our buttocks on the ground knowing that we have feet that supports us. And in this moment, uh, let us become aware of our in-breath as we breathe in and our out-breath as we breathe out. And this is in-breath. This is out-breath. In breath, out breath, feel the breath. We don't have to think about the breath.
If the breath is short, just smile to it. Allow it to be short. If the breath is long, smile to it. Allow it to be long. Breathing in, I take refuge in my in-breath from the beginning to the end. Breathing out, I take refuge to my out-breath from the beginning to the end. Following my in-breath, following my out-breath. Breathing in, I smile to my openness inside of me, capacity to learn, to see, to hear. Breathing out, I cultivate openness in me to have space for myself, to have space for my loved ones, to have space for life, to experience life in the present moment. In, openness, out, cultivating. Breathing in. I'm in touch with the quality of humility in me. Even to this breath, I am humble to life in this breath. Breathing out, I cultivate humility, an energy that allows me to connect, to be with others, and to allow others to be with me. Breathing in, humility in me. Breathing out, I cultivate this energy. Breathing in, I see myself as a drop of water letting go to enter into this river, this river of mindfulness of practicing with so many around the world. Breathing out, I am one with the river. Letting go of my inferiority complex, my equality complex, my superiority complex. In, drop of water, out, one with the river. Breathing in, I see myself as the river. Breathing out, I am supporting the river, past, present, and future, continuing to flow towards the ocean of liberation, freedom, happiness. Breathing in, I am part of the river. Breathing out, we are all flowing together.
breathing in, I smile to life inside of me, accepting myself, breathing out. I smile to life all around me, being present for what is, what is here, what is now. In, smile to life inside of me, out, I am here for the present moment. Thank you, dear friends, for practicing with us and for listening to our podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, You can find all the previous episodes of this podcast on the Plum Village app and also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. And if you like what we're doing, please subscribe to The Way Out Is In. And it would be lovely if you feel able to leave a review um, to help others discover us and to also uh, gain from listening. The podcast is co-produced by Global Optimism and the Plum Village app with support from the Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation. If you feel inspired to support the podcast as well as the international Plum Village community, moving forward, please visit our website www.tnhf.org slash donate. Thank you so much and see you next time. Yeah.